Today's session will be about neck of femur fractures and the pre-post-operative care. And this is part of the fracture school course that we have that's focused on word-based management of Tino patients. This is all under the fracture school umbrella. As I said, everything's posted on YouTube, uh, not only this program, but the previous program and any future project that we might have. This is the syllabus for our current program. All right. So for the current session on NOFs, we will want or we want to teach you how, how to deal with NOFs in the pre, intra, and post-operative uh, realm. We want to sort of teach you the basics of anatomy and physiology of, of NOFs. And we want to sort of convey the knowledge on why are NOFs such a big, important part of TNO. And I think the best way, and this is a quote that uh, definitely portrays that the best way to understand something is look at the why, look at the reasoning behind. NOFs are a big component of uh, trauma and orthopedics for various reasons. We have up to 75,000 hip fractures a year, and this number is only growing year by year. This is because the population is growing old. And as we grow old, we tend to become more frail by the end of the year. So this has a huge economic, as in cost to the healthcare, but also a huge social uh, economic repercussion. So there's an extra pressure on the healthcare system, on the associated services that we have with that. So physio, occupational, care homes, and so on. So, so it's not only a broken bone, but it's a frail group, a very specific frail group, which has a high morbidity and a high mortality associated with it. So mortality is as high as 10% within the first month, up to 30% within 12 months. So people most likely won't die because of the broken bone, but all of the complications that come with it. So that's why we have a lot of money poured into NOFs. That's why we have a lot of protocols and times to meet to make sure we avoid all of that. This is all under the guidelines of the anesthetics, frailty and orthopedic associations. And they've come up with a guide, the best practice tariff. Most of you would be already familiar with it. The biggest thing to take is we need to reduce the time to surgery. The earlier you get someone in the field and get it or fix the fracture, the least or the less complications you'll have uh, on the, on the post-operative period. So early surgery in order to promote early mobilization and avoid complications. That's the take home message. As for the anatomy of NOF, so I think everyone knows what an off is and we will only focus, we will focus on the bone aspect of it. So we're looking at the bone that's in between the pelvis and the lower leg, the thigh bone called the femur. And we, when we talk about NOFs, neck of femur fractures is the proximal end of the femur. Now, why is this so important? And why are there so many different ways that we can fix them? It's, you don't need to know all of this. You don't need to go that much uh, into that much detail. But the important thing is if the head of the femur, meaning this ball here, the femur loses its blood supply, meaning if there's a loss of the connection of the vessels with the head, you can't use the head, the bone just dies. So then you need to replace the head. So the whole surgical fixation methods that we choose or replacement methods, it's related to the blood supply. Is the blood supply to the head of the femur viable? If so, we might consider just fixing it in situ if it's compromised, you need to replace it because it would be a piece of that bone that goes into necrosis. So taking into, the con the, in, into consideration the image on your right, I want you guys to give it a go. Uh, probably people who already attended to the first course, the acute management have seen these pictures, but give it a go text in the, uh, in the chat box. What do you think this fracture pattern is for a neck of femur fracture? Is it intracapsular, intratrochanteric, or subtrochanteric? And I'll give you a few minutes to think. All right, so 
guys, this is definitely a subtrochanteric fracture. The, I guess this is a new cohort. There's not a lot of people have been to the first one, but when we look at a hip and we look at the femur, so I'll, you can see my mouse, I'll outline the head in the acetalum within the pelvis. Yeah, this is the head of the femur. And these, oh, this portion here is the neck. Yeah, these are the trochanters. And I'm pointing at the healthy hip right now. These are the trochanters and everything beneath this onto the shaft is the subtrochanteric region, as you can see on the right-hand side picture. So when you focus on the left one, if you do the same thing, let's look at the head. Seems to be within the cuff, the acetabulum. You can see the necks clearly. Then you can see the trochanters. This one might have been broken, yes, but you can still see a little bit of the shaft, right? Yes, there might be a bit of comminution on the lesser trochanter, but still, it's a subtrochanteric fracture, maybe with a little bit of extension, but it's definitely a subtrochanteric fracture. So, what about this one, guys? What do you think this one is? I'll give you a few more seconds or minutes to think about. And remember to outline the bone, outline the cortex, and think is it within the head? Is it the neck? Is it the trochanters, or is it distal to all of that? Well, for all of those who said B, you would be correct. It is an enteric fracture. So the head itself is all right. And it is a bit complicated to follow. But if you follow through the neck, you can see that the neck seems to be intact. On the superior end of the neck, same thing, superior aspect seems to be intact. And the fracture line actually starts on the trochanters goes along and there is a significant displacement of the fracture we're just looking at the anterior posterior view because we shouldn't really get into this specific section of the presentation too much but uh, it is definitely an intertrochanteric fracture should always look at both views both the lateral and the ap but that's uh, that's something we can explain a bit later and last one last x-ray to read what do you guys think this one is? A, intercapsular, B, intertrochanteric, C, subtrochanteric. Yeah, yeah, I think I think you guys got it. Definitely, definitely an A, an intercapsular fracture. So I'll go back just for a second. This is A, intercapsular. Going back, a B, intertrochanteric. Going back, subtrochanteric. This is important for the fixation method when we get into that. We don't only look at just the boards. We look at a lot of things. There is a lot of signs that you can look at to better read an x-ray, but uh, it's not the focus of this lecture. So we look at multiple lines, and you should look at both pelvis. You should look a little bit onto the abdomen, but that's not the focus of this lecture. So focusing on the preoperative care, thinking about the preoperative care and all of the goals that we're trying to meet with the best practice tariff. Uh, it's very important or what we should aim at as a broad spectrum is to follow through the medical plan, reverse or optimize the patient the best we can so that in the morning we can meet the criteria of bringing NOFs to theater within that 36 hours uh, uh, time frame. So as you're receiving a patient from the ED department that has a broken leg, you'll probably notice just from the end of bed that he's most likely or most patients will have some degree of confusion. They'll be very fatigued. They'll be slightly restless and complaining of pain. This is a, a very common picture because these patients have sustained not only a new trauma, it's a specific age group that's really frail with multiple comorbidities. They have been in ED, in ambulance. They've been brought from home after long lives. So they're completely exhausted. They've been waiting hours and hours and they're anxious in regards to the new medical admission and the new trauma and the perspective of having surgery. 
specifically when you look at the limb and this clay part should be familiar to the ones who attended the previous course you'll see a very common trend you'll see most likely some degree of shortening of the affected limb so you can diagnose broken bones just by the end of the bed with relatively confident the limb usually is externally rotated there might be some mild swelling around the affected area and if you touch it for some reason if you're examining it it will be specifically tender over the proximal aspect of the femur and you'll see that they cannot straight leg raise meaning they cannot lift the leg on the flat bed or slightly inclined bed by themselves by using the hip force and if you also promote or if you touch tap the bottom of the foot the ankle you'll prompt pain or you will prompt pain on the on the hip portion and this is a picture that depicts the ward or the limb presentation of an off as you're receiving someone from the ed department or whatever the other ward that might be with a knoff with a neck of femur fracture with the potential of going uh, undergoing a surgical procedure you should always verify first and foremost that you have the correct patient that the porters or whoever is moving the patient has the correct ward for the patient and that you know who's medically responsible for the patient so you should see if it is let's say the orthopedic team the neurosurgical team whoever the patient is if there's an allocated medical and the team consultant written within notes so you confirm it's the right patient, you confirm it's the right bay, you confirm you're the team that's supposed to take over and you allocate the bed to the patient. On transferring, you guys are very familiar with the methods of transfer. So any method that doesn't flex the hip or the leg or it doesn't move on uh, too acutely the angles, it's totally fine. Pat slide is the most common and you want to keep that limb immobilized, non-weight bearing, and avoid any extreme movements in order to avoid complications. Let's say if it's a really nasty fracture with very like sharp spikes, you might have potentially make it open if you move the leg around. Very important on the preoperative period is to read the medical notes. On our trust, we use eye care. Read the clerking to make sure you know the story behind why the person fell and a little bit about the past medical history read the most recent up-to-date plan from the medical team that has the responsibility of the patient who is responsible for the patient, as in any ongoing management that will expedite care and time to surgery from transfusions, antibiotics, fluid replacements, and any sort of investigations that the team wants uh, completed overnight. Confirm the time of surgery and the affected limb, as in, is the patient actually planned for the next day or is it someone that's too unwell that won't definitely be operated the next day? Or is it someone that's too unwell that needs to go right now? So why would I give this patient dinner right now if they're planning to do the surgery at 1 a.m., for example? So there's a lot that can change. Even with the, with the, the following lectures, you'll realize that, but NOFs usually are not done overnight. And any neurovascular concerns from the medical team if there's any OBS that they specifically want done overnight, it's important also to think about. As you come onto the day of surgery, the pre-op checklist is a big thing. It's a document that needs to be filled in. And you guys are very familiar with it, as in any healthcare professional is familiar with it. There's a lot of checks that need to be done. You need to make sure there's a consent that's label signed and understood by the patient if they have capacity. ID bands, allergies, documented MRSA status, and a few more checks as in personal belongings and so and so, removal of jewelry, loose caps and crowns and etc. And now on or going into the surgical methods of fixation according to the type of broken hip. So keep in mind the the classification and the broken and the division of neck of femur fracture that we had and the questions that we had, and we'll go on to a few more pictures. If it's intracapsular, as I said, it means that the head blood supply might be compromised, meaning you need to replace the head most likely. It depends on the degree of the displacement. Let's say if the fracture is very much in the initial position, you would consider fixing it in situ and see if the blood supply is viable. 
If it's intertrochanteric, the same principle applies. And if it's subtrochanteric, you think about nails and dynamic hip screws. Well, I'll show you some pictures so you understand what I'm saying. All of this with the goal of providing early mobilization, controlling the pain, and avoiding all of the risks that we so 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 that we are so familiar with. So over here, you can see I've kept the table on the right hand side, so you can keep checking on the type of fracture that it is and the type of fixation method that we choose. We have on the left hand side a hip. Oh, this is an AP of the pelvis, but you have on the left hip an intracapsular fracture that you can see there. For intracapsular fractures, as we said, a replacement's most likely the way to go if the, the feel or the femoral head blood supply might be compromised. It won't be viable. So there's no point fixing it, as in using just screws and plates to put in situ. You need to replace the whole thing. This is the replacement, but a total hip replacement. So depending on the age group of the patient, if you see a cup around the acetabulum, it means it's a total hip. So the age group that usually you go for total hips is a younger age group than the common neck of femur fra frail patients. This is one of the methods for fixation on the intracapsular. So intracapsular neck of femur fracture, but that was let's say, very much undisplaced. So you would try and fix it in situ, assuming that the arteries are not compromised around. A DHS, a dynamic hip screw. So you can see the screw, the special screw, the plate, and the cortical screws breaching the whole femur. A nail, yet another nail that you can see. This one's a very good example of a subtrochanteric nail. Over there, you can see a fracture line and the nail goes and bypasses the fracture line onto the medulla of the bone, meaning the inner aspect of the bone and stabilizes the whole thing. Plus some screws proximally stabilizing. So on to the post-operative period, which is the most important part of this lecture, I believe, because it's the period that people deal with the patients the longest. The same applies as someone's coming and being stepped down from the recovery room, being from theaters. You need to check, is it the right patient? Am I the right team to take responsibility for? Is it the right consultant? And who should I look or escalate to? Is it medical, ortho, neurosurgery, general surgery, whatsoever? And if so, you will initiate patient transfer safely and you're the team taking responsibility for the patient from there on. It's very important as you're taking over a patient post-operative, especially on this age group, the frail age group, that you read through the anesthetic and the surgical note, meaning the operative note and the anesthetic chart, because it moves you onto what went wrong with the patient intraoperatively, but also what might go wrong post-operatively. So knowing what type of surgery the patient has, what type of anesthesia the patient has, there's specific things that spinal does to the body that general doesn't, as in blood pressure, as most people realize on the, on the healthcare professional realm. There's also the possibility that you read and identify acute blood losses in theater. So is this patient, or if the patient lost 1.5 liters of blood, he'll probably be quite dry and the team will probably want to transfuse. So as you go onto the surgical plan, you'll start seeing correlations into what happened intraoperatively and what the surgeon would like the patient to have. So everything from the weight bearing status, wound care, antibiotics, and then follow up and so should be mentioned and should be written on the operative note. Usually we restart every single regular medication, but to be wary of a lot of exceptions as, it, and as in anything in medicine. So patients who are dry or lost a lot of blood, you don't really want to start antihypertensive. So feel free to reach out and question and ask pharmacy, ask the medical team, blood thinning medication. Be careful with that. So is it too early to start the Claxane or not? Diabetic meds, make sure you check glucose before you start giving insulin because intraoperative the anesthetics might have changed the regimen. Analgesia, if they've already had quite a bit of opioids, you should probably be wary of prescribing more or even giving more uh, on the post-operative period. 
as for complications a lot literally a lot everything can go wrong from mental and cognition related complications to heart to lungs to abdomen from just a distension constipation to major bleeds that are stress induced from trauma acute retention loss of blood and then deficiencies from protein and calories and also most more specific vitamins so a lot can go wrong on the post operative post operative period and you will never be able to memorize every single complication what's important to know is when do the complications happen when should you expect to have a wound infection when should you expect to have an mi or stroke and this is a really nice graphic that depicts that so at the time of operation as in acute let's say day zero day one post-op you're looking at the big picture stuff you're looking at major bleeds at airway obstructions at mis and strokes and post-op retention and renal failure from anesthetics and drugs and even the surgery itself so this is the big picture stuff usually very acutely that kills the patient like in less than a day less than an hour sometimes by the day four to day 10 day five to day 10 withdrawal stuff from alcoholic people or even other sort of bleeds but more slow bleeds then as you go into the first week of operation then you start looking at infection infection takes a while bacteria takes a while to sediment and to settle down it's not a patient that's day zero that didn't have an infection post-op that's going to develop a chest infection or major wound infection an hour after being in a septic environment a, a completely sterile environment that is the theater so it's someone that it's a week a week and a half after operation that might start having a wound infection that might start having a dvt and a p and what do you do how do you deal with these patients so there is protocols there's performance there's always systematic ways of approaching this you won't be the first healthcare professional that needs to deal with a sick patient it's all important to know very important to know how to escalate and who to escalate to and how do you know that well you need the set of obs you do your set of obs you go through the machine you do your scoring system and you know where you find yourself let's say a patient scores 14 15 25 you're very concerned so it's a major arrest call is a critical care outreach bleep it's the bleep of the medical team that's responsible for the patients everyone on site and all all hands on deck so patient scores zero he was a bit i don't know short of breath but he scored the zero you were just a bit concerned but he's scoring a zero all right it's not too concerned let's repeat the obs in one two hours but it's very important to at least have a set of ops to triage properly unwell patients. Let's say you're responsible for a whole bay, four, five, six patients. Multiple patients are unwell at the same time. You need to call for help. Call your senior nurse, your nurse in charge, and say, I have multiple patients that are unwell at the same time. I'm going to do ops in all of them, but I can't take responsibility for all of them. So calling for help, very important. Triaging according to new score, having a full set of ops, it's also very important and then start your assessment. Anyone can start an assessment. Any healthcare professional should start an assessment within their competencies. So the ABCDs are very known to everyone. So after you have your new score, what can you do to the patient with your skills to improve the patient? You don't need to wait for the medical team. You don't need to wait for the critical care outreach team to, if a patient's, I don't know, gargling a little bit of saliva, you can set the head up right you can suction the saliva you can make sure the patient's breathing you can titrate the oxygen up in a number rebreathable mask you can do a lot whilst you're waiting for the medical team to come around if it's a concerning patient so you can make sure you have the monitor machine 24 7 next to them the obs machine you can Let's say it's a really low blood pressure patient. You ease the legs up to bring the blood back to the body, to the heart, to the, to the head. If it's a patient that's, I don't know, looking cold and very hypothermic, you can warm the patient up. You can get the bear hugger ready. You can start a lot and always remember to go on a systematic approach, A, B, C, D. And within your knowledge, start the process of optimizing the patient. 
And one thing that I personally relate to is the importance. So I really, really keep reinforcing to every colleague that I have that it's very important to know how to communicate clearly, as in we all know about the S bar, but we rarely ever use it. So you should know how to escalate not only to a medical team, but to anyone really, or even referring a patient to physio, escalating to the sister in charge. You should always call someone or introduce yourself. You need to state what the issue is in a brief sentence, as in I'm concerned about this patient because, and then you go on to the story, to the background, as in, yes, he's this age, he had this surgery, and I've noticed right now on my assessment that, I don't know, he is very, very short of breath and I've done this so far, but I think I need help, but I think we should do this scan, but I think you should come and review the patient. And going on to a few more questions, I wanna test your knowledge. So what do you think about these wounds? A very short question, very short case study. Which of these wounds do you think it's infected? Yes, definitely. We have a clearly infected wound on the A, on the first picture on the left-hand side on the A, it's mostly a hematoma. Yes, it might have a bit of a collection underneath and off of blood, but it's just a hematoma, it's just bruising. And it's important to distinguish both of them because a hematoma is a very common wound presentation, especially in such an invasive hip surgery. <clears throat> and number B, letter B, sorry, might be just a bit of iodine staining. Who knows? It might develop an infection later on, but at the moment, we wouldn't be particularly concerned. Now, case study two. So the, you'll have, let's say you're the only healthcare professional covering a bay. Uh, your colleagues are on the break. You're taking observations from this specific patient, a 76 years old male. Day 11, post left hemi arthroplasty for an off and ecofema fracture. He is known to have high blood pressure, a heart procedure, the, the, the stent procedure for the heart, and he is COPD also. He lives with the next of kin. He uses TDS carers and has a Z frame in the house. He's not very independent. And you've done your OBS, you have a news of four with high respirate, with low SATs, blood pressure. You have heart rate at 127, but he's alert and apyrexia. So what's your, what's your management? What do you do? I want a systematic approach. I want you guys to type in the chat sort of five steps on your first approach when you do this set of ops by, I don't know, bay three, bed four. You've just done the ops. You're next to the patient. What do you do? Definitely, definitely go back to your basics. Definitely go back to escalating. If you're by yourself, call for help. It's a news of four. It's a significant and well patient to be concerned. So you start by calling someone. You escalate. You make sure you have support that you need. And you go on to do your assessment. So if you have a patient that is desatting, remember, let's get the bed side up. Let's provide with oxygen, high flow oxygen, non rebreathing mass. Let's maybe consider removing secretions, fluid, suctioning, and keep going through the algorithm. Always go back to the algorithm. So what do you think your differential might be with this specific presentation? What do you guys think? Pulmonary embolism, definitely. So a desatting patient, day 11, this is a very important thing. So it's late. So yes, infection might be on the differential diagnosis. So I want to see who, who can tell me what points towards a pulmonary embolism, like two things that point towards a pulmonary embolism. Can anyone text that? Can anyone spot them on the presentation?
Exactly. So you have the painful leg, which is not the leg that's been operated on, which is always very important to spot because if people complain of pain in the same leg, it's still possible. It might still be masking. But when you look at painful leg, make sure it's not the hip that's painful or make sure at least that you check the calf itself, the lower leg, not the thigh. And if it's the leg that's painful, not the thigh, it's probably something related to that. But yeah, leg pain, desatic patient with high tachycardia, meaning high um, heart rate, it's definitely possible and likely a P. Doesn't mean it's not possible other things with multiple comorbidities, but for this one, it could be a P. So as we go on with the presentation, I also put on this clip or this graphic, which depicts the importance that, or the, the important aspect of NOF, so of neck of femur fracture patients, as in it's a frail age group, it's a mosaic of comorbidities, is patients who are frail, aging, and are not already in a well state when they broke, break their hip or they break their hip most likely because they've been having a deterioration, a decline on the quality of their living. So a holistic approach is definitely needed. It's not just about fixing the hip. You need to get physios involved. You need to do false assessment. You need to do dietitians reviews. You need to improve the patient as a whole. And that's where the frailty team, the orthogeriatrics team, uh, shines they're really good at having a, a holistic approach to the medical patient because it is the medical patient that's why it is the the, the big protocol is orthogeries takes over because surgeons just fix the hip but there's a lot more that can go wrong with the patient and my hope is that you go home and you, you go back to your practice and you remember that NOFs we want to fix early and quick to avoid all of those complications that I showed on the big table we want to have a holistic approach we want to not only fix the hip but we want to look out for all of the other medical reasons that the patient sustained the fall and we want to expedite care because the earlier we fix it the better and the quicker people can mobilize and avoid complications